This is the American Law Journal. The Food and Drug Administration, pharmaceutical manufacturers, off-label marketing, and what does any of that have to do with free speech and the First Amendment? Good evening, I'm Christopher Naughton. Tonight is pharma off-label marketing at a crossroads. The Supreme Court has weighed in, so will my three guests. Hope Freewald is here in the studio today with Deckert, and Deckert known around the world for the representation of pharmaceutical corporations. Kate Greenwood joins us for the first time. She is with Seton Hall Law's Center for Health and Pharmaceutical Law and Policy. And Brian McCormick, plaintiff's counsel, is with us once again with the Scheller PC firm in Philadelphia. And he and the firm have been responsible for some of the largest pharmaceutical settlements in our nation's history in just over the last Three years. Just recently, GlaxoSmithKline reached a three billion dollar settlement with the United States government with regards to its drugs Paxil, Wellbutrin, and Avandia. And and Brian, I know you've been involved in some of these uh, in some of these huge blockbuster cases. Here are some of the other ones uh, that uh, you've been involved in over the last few years. It seems as though the common strain, or some of the common strains, are off-label marketing and an antipsychotic or an antidepressant? Well, the off-label marketing is where they're coming, is where the government has put its focus over the last couple of years. Uh, the antidepressant and antipsychotic and antineurological type medicines are, I don't want to say an easy mark, but that's where the companies are making their money now. They can market these, which are limited for indications, bipolar, schizophrenia, and then they can limit them for everything from headaches to ADHD for kids to sleep aids. So mm -hmm. it's a big money product, all blockbuster drugs. And uh, that's where the government's looking. And there's no question it's where the government's looking. It's a big business for the government. The government's making a lot of money pursuing these cases. I think the important thing to say about this is you can tell perhaps a lot less about conduct from the size of these settlements than you can about the power of the government to bring cases where they can hold the threat of uh, criminal sentencing against individuals in the company over the company's head, and they can, and they can threaten the company with essentially being out of the market to provide their products uh, to any federal uh, agency. And you, think and, that, and you think that's the main reason that the numbers are so big? That has that got to be a huge driver in, in where this is going. But the gist of it is that these are blockbuster drugs that mm -hmm. the government knows if it walks like a duck, it looks like a duck, it is a duck. If they are off-label marketing, whatever they're doing wrong is leading eventually to a false claim because those doctors and those physicians and those hospitals are out there using the drug where they shouldn't be. So the Medicare, Medicaid, whatever it is, is paying money. And the way to get at it is the way to, the pharmaceutical companies get those prescriptions written is to off-label market and promote the drug for a reason it shouldn't be. And it pays, you know, if you have a $30 billion drug and you're paying a billion dollar in fine over 10 years, that's a pretty good deal. Well, I think it's important to distinguish clearly between off-label use and off-label marketing. Thank so you. just very briefly, off-label use is when a physician, which they're fully within their rights to do, prescribes a product, a drug or a device for a use or to a member of a certain population, like a pregnant woman or a child, or perhaps at a dose that's not approved on the label. Physicians are permitted to do that, and we as patients want them to do that. Off-label marketing, when the pharmaceutical company or device company promotes the product for one of those uses that it perhaps hasn't studied, that definitely the FDA has not has not reviewed with its panel of outside experts, with its own FDA scientists, and determined that the benefits of the of the product for that use in that population at that dose outweigh the risks. So that type of marketing, marketing for off-label uses is prohibited, and that's what all of these cases are about. And Brian, you know, we've seen, of course, uh, over the last several years, uh, for many years now, but more and more, drug companies using the airwaves to promote their products, uh, direct to consumer advertising. So we know that that's part of the society we, we live in, it's perfectly legal. And as Kate was saying, uh, it, it's, it's fine to prescribe a drug 
for a specific use once the FDA has approved it. But the gray area now that people need to understand is the off-label use. The example I can give from one of our cases is a drug called Zyprexa, which was made by Eli Lilly. It was at the time, it was settled for $1.5 billion. It was a drug that was indicated for very, very limited uses, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Uh, Eli Lilly had a plan set up to market that drug to pediatricians, to the elderly. It was used to get out there to other, to more wider uses that just weren't those two, headaches, sleep aids. It was used for everything. And that atypical antipsychotic at the time was the largest settlement, but that was a specific example. You know, I think we have to step back. I, I want to pick up for a moment on a point that was made earlier. I also think the consumer has to understand that there is a huge gray area in what is permitted and not permitted for pharmaceutical companies. Certainly, certain things are not permitted. But what we're seeing increasingly is that there are areas where the FDA has not given clear guidance, um, where the FDA has said, we can tell you that you shouldn't do this, but we can't tell you that it's OK to do that. Right. And um, the drug companies are faced with often inconsistent decision making and, and situations sometimes where they feel that they are the only ones who are allowed to give honest and fair and balanced information about their own medicines. Everybody else can talk about it. Hospitals can talk about it. Insurance companies with their own financial but models our, can but talk our, about I hope, it. But we've always stood on this principle. The doctor is the learned intermediary. If he determines based on his research and research of other doctors that a drug that is not that has been approved by the FDA but not for the reasons he is prescribing it to his patient, if some good comes out of that, he can continue to prescribe that. But is it the, the purpose and the right of a pharmaceutical company to come out and say, our research that we have determined shows that this off-label use is working and we want to go ahead and market that, as opposed to saying we're depending on the learned doctors and that's what we're, and that's what we're uh, hoping will be promoted. We're not talking about coming forward and with, with a, an advertising campaign for something that is clearly not approved. Uh, in, in the FDA approved label. And, and Hope's right, but that's the, that's the least of our problems. I mean, we are talking about plans that have been set up by the pharmaceutical companies to market and target these off-label uses. Maybe now that the government has targeted these cases and targeted these companies and said this isn't going to happen anymore, that gray area may be the only problem. But in the past, and from what we're even seeing now, the companies continue to target these off-label these off-label movements and marketing and promotion. So it's not just the gray area; it is the straight out. We're going to go ahead and do it, and we'll see what happens in the end. Kate, paint me a picture here. Let's let's get some illustrations going because I think that that will help the audience understand exactly what we're talking about. All right. So a doctor or a group of doctors determines that a drug, again approved by the FDA, but not for the reasons that doctors are prescribing it, is working in a different area. And they're giddy. They're saying, hey, did you know that Wellbutrin doesn't only, only help you stop smoking? By God, it even helps you with depression. What is the next step and what would be the right thing to do to get that information out to the consumer? I mean, I hear what both Brian and Hope are saying. I think that it's the means and the methods of getting it out to the consumer that they probably disagree with. Well, I think that the farm, if by the consumer you, you don't mean the physician, you mean the patient, I think that the pharmaceutical company has very little wiggle room when it comes to communicating about off-label uses with patients. Uh, even the pharmaceutical companies are not advocating for the ability to engage in direct-to-consumer advertising with regard to off-label uses. Pharmaceutical companies do uh, fund individual investigators, physicians who have an idea and want to see if they can prove in a systematic way that what they're seeing uh, anecdotally in their clinical practice can be rigorously established with a randomized controlled trial. Uh, that's not as common as company-initiated trials, uh, it's not as common as government-funded trials of new uses of already approved drugs. And is that where you have the problem, Brian, that it's, that it's company 
uh, instituted, that these trials are instituted by the, the company? Well, I mean, we can start, you know, we can go down that road and talk about government or company sponsored trials and what the problems are there with the ghost writing and whether the data is actually getting to the FDA and whether the physician or the clinical trial investigator is actually doing what he's supposed to be doing. But You're that suggesting is, that the drug companies are promulgating or encouraging the doctors to conduct these trials based well, on either their information or their desire to well, I think what that's, the, I think, that's I, his I think argument, are, but that's think, not I the think, reality. I think with, <laughs> oh, come on now. I think what they are doing here is when the, they control the clinical trials mm -hmm. and they control the money, and every college, university, and almost every clinical investigator across the country knows that they're going to get money for this type of study, and if they don't, they're going to get cut off, and they're going to lose that extra income on top of what they're already making, then it does put the fear of the pharmaceutical companies controlling what that goes and the way it goes. Now we see many, many more studies moving over to Europe, moving over to Asia, moving over to Africa, because it's easier for the pharmaceutical companies in those areas to control all these international studies. But the, I mean, that, that is a totally different <laughs> show and idea, but what that leads to is if the FDA doesn't control off-label marketing or promotion and what the, the companies have, have no incentive to do these clinical trials, because if, the, if the, they can market for any use, any indication, then why do they have to go and do a clinical trial to get an indication? It wouldn't make, it, there's no financial incentive for them to do that. That's why the FDA needs to keep control and keeps these regulatory controls over off-label marketing. You know, two points. I mean, one, I don't think you can stress enough that there are many drugs that started out off-label for a particular indication and became on-label. I think the easiest one that everybody knows about is aspirin and heart attack prevention. Aspirin did not start out as anything other than a pain medication. Mm -hmm. And today people commonly take it for heart attack prevention. That's a huge advancement and it flows from the ability of doctors to use medicines off label and then for the science to follow that. So that right, you're saying that the time. FDA approved the secondary usages. So eventually these uses can get approved. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're not because sometimes the drug is is off patent. Frankly, it is very, very expensive to do pharmaceutical trials. It takes a long time and sometimes things become accepted practice independent of the approval. The second point, I, it's interesting to listen to Brian because Brian kind of creates this damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario. First, he says that anything that hasn't been subject to tests by the pharmaceutical companies and is off-label is bad because it hasn't been subject to the test. And then in the same breath, he says, well, but we don't really trust any of the testing that the pharmaceutical companies do anyway. So even if they do the testing, it's really not worth anything. I, I, I think... That's, I mean, that's a very jaded view of the world. The fact is that a lot of good research comes out of pharmaceutical companies, a lot of advancements, and sometimes it comes out of, of other sources. Sometimes we see things from other sources as well. But the question is, can the companies that make these medicines play any role in those discussions? Is there an appropriate non-promotional way for them to play a role they, recognizing their First Amendment they, rights? But aren't the pharmaceutical companies already integrally involved with the medical profession? Even before, let's, let's put the marketing and the promotion of it just to the side for a moment. Aren't they consistently interacting with the American Medical Association, with the New England Journal of Medicine, with, with every you know, medical publication and enclave in the nation to discuss, to interact, to, to talk about you know, the, the, the benefits of drugs on label and off label. And they only get in trouble and they get, they get hit with these very large settlements when they start to push you know, doctors to prescribe to their patients these drugs which haven't been approved by the FDA, but go ahead and and push these drugs so that they're used off-label. Well, I'm just going to respectfully disagree with the characterization because I think what you're seeing, again, as Kate says, is there is a lot of gray area. And and there are there are there have been guidances, there have been suggestions by the FDA, but there aren't clear rules. And in many cases, there have been um, requests for information, responses to requests, and then after the fact, there is, there is a suggestion that the behavior is somehow improper. 
and a lot of a lot of what's going on right now is just hey shouldn't there be some clearer guidance here on when companies can talk about their own medicine with fair balance of the risk and benefit in one situation we've seen recently a company actually knew that its medicine was being used off label and wanted to get out there and be more proactive in talking about the safe use that was going on anyway frankly a company can have a product liability concern about not getting out there and talking is that okay or not okay. We didn't get clear guidance on that. That's a real, that's an issue. And, and personally, I think that the consumer of the medicine should be looking for the fullest possible discussion, the most informed discussion. Brian, well, I mean, H Hope's right. I guess I am a little jaded. But you see the number, some of the settlements you already talked about, $3 billion, a billion and a half dollars, $520 million. These settlements didn't come about because of this gray area. These settlements came about because these companies were doing something knowingly and willfully and raising their profits. And that's a shame. But yeah, a little bit jaded, that's there. I mean, mm -hmm. I, these pharmaceutical companies do watch out for the consumers, but they also have to put their sh shareholder and, and uh, profits there, and they have to watch out for that at the same time. Kate, uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, this case that just came down from the Supreme Court just just months ago, uh, and, and some have said it's, it's a landmark case, or at least it's a significant case. It's the Sorrell case, and they're saying that off-label marketing, off-label usage and off-label marketing might be at a crossroads. What, what are your thoughts on that? So very briefly, the IMS versus Sorrell case involved a law that was passed in Vermont mm -hmm. that restricted pharmaceutical companies from using prescriber-specific data, so data on what individual physicians were prescribing. It, it prevented them from using that data to better target their marketing. So it prevented them from saying, well, physician A is prescribing our drug uh, this amount of our drugs, so we think he would be a good target for a sales representative. So the Vermont decided that it would ban that use in order to reduce prescribing of branded drugs in favor of less expensive generics. The Supreme Court invalidated the law, held that it was a violation of the First Amendment, and commentators in the wake of the decision have suggested that if that law is invalid, then the ban on off-label promotion can't be far behind. I disagree, uh, and I am hopeful that the ban on off-label promotion can survive because I think that that case is very distinguishable. Notably, that case involved on-label promotion. So the safety issue just wasn't there. Vermont was open about the fact that it was not so much a public health concern that motivated it that caused it to want to make the advertising less effective. It was rather the public purse that they were concerned about. And with off-label promotion, the situation is very different. First of all, there's a neutral justification for the ban. It incentivizes research. And we, as patients, I think, are very interested in seeing that research get done. With government funding flat or falling, the pharmaceutical company's contribution to research is even more important than it has been. And Without the ban on off-label promotion, they could seek an indication, get approved for that indication, and then have no incentive to do further research on the drug as information became available about promising new uses. With the ban, they have a strong incentive to do the rigorous clinical trials, submit to the FDA approval process, mm -hmm. because uh, they want to promote their drug on label because their promotion is very effective. And the, for that reason, the incentive is very effective. Well, here's what uh, Boston law professor uh, Kevin Uderson said, uh, and he wrote an amicus brief, by the way, in this, uh, in this Sorrell case that went to the Supreme Court. In the wake of this decision, we can expect the FDA to relax rules against off-label promotion. He sees the Supreme Court's decision as a radical adjustment of the regulatory balance between the FDA and the companies it regulates. I have to think you think differently than Mr. Utterson. Look, I'm, you know, I, I don't consider myself a First Amendment scholar. I think the Sorrell opinion is an important one. I certainly think that we're going to continue to see um, the FDA regulate um, off-label promotion in some way. But the opinion is highly important because it's saying, look, you, you can't just, just discriminate from a First Amendment standpoint 
against pharmaceutical companies because they're pharmaceutical companies. You can't say, well, we're going to let everybody else have this information about the prescribing practices, except the pharmaceutical companies, we, because we think they're not going to use it in the right way. And that, that is part of the problem, is that there are, is this user-based discrimination um, that is part of this gray area with the off-label promotion. And I think, I think the, the lines are going to have to get clarified. Well, I, I don't claim to be a First Amendment scholar either, but I think what the Sorrell really says is the pharmaceutical companies can have this data, and, and IMS con controls and, and gathers this data all over the country. The pharmaceutical companies can have it. You just can't use it for promotion and marketing. That was what the, that was what the statute said. Not that they couldn't have it. I mean, they can have it. They can buy it. That's what they do. They buy it from IMS every day of the week. Mm -hmm. So I think it was just, it was, it's a more limited ruling by that. I, I, I think the Sorrell. I don't agree with that at all. I think the Sorrell ruling is another ruling by the Roberts Court, similar to the Citizens United case last year where they allowed corporations and uh, to give money to political campaign and they wrote down McCain-Feingold. I think it's another ruling for the corporations to open up their First Amendment and to what had been regulated by the government and should be regulated areas are now being opened wide up and uh, letting it, it could potentially be a huge problem. And it might be, Brian, that uh, like Citizens United, this is where the American people, if they don't like the outcome of this case, this is where Congress has to make the, the choice to make the change. I, I think in this case, uh, the pharmaceutical companies shouldn't be treated differently. The Supreme Court and Congress has controlled commercial speech for, as you said, 50, 200 years. Pharmac there was a reason behind the Vermont statute. Uh, the Supreme Court chose to ignore that reason, um, and they wanted to control. They wanted to give the pharmaceutical company a greater right than other companies and other and other uh, corporations have in this First Amendment right. So I think in this case they've stepped over a bound, and I think that they need to, just like Citizens United, frankly, in my opinion, need to step back. Kate Greenwood, what does this case mean for the average consumer? How might it impact him or her? To the extent that Professor Outerson and others are correct that this signifies a significant shift in, in traditional notions of what's appropriate for agencies uh, to what types of restrictions are, are appropriate and, and expected when, when regulators are interacting with the regulated entities that they oversee, it could have wide-reaching implications that, that extend across context. And I think that's what Justice Breyer discusses at, at length in his dissent, and he brings in a number of examples from uh, electric companies to the antitrust context to securities law in, in many of these areas it's it's expected that the that the agency's rules are only going to apply to the entities that that agency regulates for example so there are typically speaker based restrictions but they're not the speaker based restrictions that we hear about on the pure political speech side where they're clearly proscribed. They haven't traditionally been proscribed on the commercial speech side. So Justice Breyer and Professor Outerson contend that this could be, be quite monumental. Hope, do you think that we, uh, you know, in our society we should move away from restrictions on off-label marketing? Are we doing more harm to the consumers? Should we just uh, allow uh, pharmaceutical companies, based on their own fair assessment, to go out and promote all off-label benefits of a certain drug? You know, Kate started on this point, and I, and I agree with her. I don't think anybody is saying that they expect there to be free range in saying whatever you want to say. That's, that's not the system we have. Drugs are approved for certain indications. Um, I think the issue is one of clarity and guidance, particularly when companies are faced with potentially very serious sanctions if they get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to have a, an honest conversation where patients can understand that there is potential benefit by their doctors getting fully educated in potential off-label uses. And so I don't, I'm not here to say that I think that we're going to see 
unlimited, end, right. unlimited off-label right. promotion. I don't think that's what this conversation is about at all. I think that I think the conversation really is and should be about um, how companies are allowed to respond in certain situations to requests for information, how they can engage in reasonable medical discussion mm -hmm. that can often be beneficial to patients, recognizing in a lot of areas there just aren't very many approved choices for patients. Brian, we're seeing a lot more commercials these days of doctors, their names are on the screen, they're not playing doctors, they are doctors, and they're promoting the use of certain drugs. Do you have a problem with that? I don't, if they're promoting it the way they're supposed to be promoting it. If a doctor is say, stepping up there and saying that this drug is indicated for uh, psoriasis and I'm treating it for psoriasis. If the doctor, and if there is a full and complete disclosure that that doctor is either being paid by the pharmaceutical company for that ad or that doctor is doing something else, he's writing an article or he's doing a CLE or whatever he is, that we know that that pharmaceutical company or that doctor have an arm's length transaction going on and they're not in bed with each other okay. and then it's fine. You folks, we're here every Monday night dispensing legal advice and peering into various practice areas in the law tonight, off-label pharmaceutical marketing and usage. But if you need more information, when we're not on the air, go to our website, American Law Journal TV or simply Law Journal TV. Tweet us on Twitter or go to our Facebook page Go to the website, get your law on demand. I want to thank Hope Freewald for making a return after thank about you. five years or so to the studio. From Deckert, Kate Greenwood from Seton Hall Law Center for Health and Pharmaceutical Law and Policy, and Brian McCormick from Scheller PC <laughs> in Center City, Philadelphia. And for all of us here at the American Law Journal, until next week, case closed. Tonight's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by Scheller PC, a nationally recognized personal injury law firm protecting individuals against dangerous pharmaceutical medicine, including antidepressants, antipsychotic drugs, defective products and medical devices, and other personal injury matters. And the Legal Intelligencer, the nation's oldest legal newspaper for lawyers.